I'll generally walk into a meeting, um, wherever that's, that is, or I'll walk into a club and I'll struggle to see someone that looks like me. You know, it, it's frightening to see where the women's game can go in the next few years, but the great thing is um, the women's game is on a up at the moment, um, but I don't think um, we, we, we're quite diverse enough and, and more needs to be done. What inspired you to become a rugby league coach? Oh, bit of a bit of a strange one, really. I was um, I retired from playing, and um, we were at a training session at a club called uh, Batley Batley Rugby League Club. And I remember I was heading down to a training session, and usual place. And every time we'd get there, there'd always be a team. And I think it was like an under tens team, and the coach that was coaching the team would always be screaming at them, shouting at them. And we'd be training or waiting to train and it'd really wind me up. And one day he said something real negative to a kid and I went over to confront him. But as I set off to confront him, one of the players stopped me and said, listen, Craig, at the end of the day, he's coaching them. If you think you can do better, then go get yourself a team. And he actually stopped me from, from going over and confronting his coach about his language, his behaviours. And um, you know something, on the back of that, driving on, I just thought, you know something, <laughs> I'll show you. I'll go out and I'll go get a team, which would be my old community club anyway. And um, I know I can do better than what he did. So that that was my first taste of, of wanting to go out there and coach. How, how would your coaching differ then in comparison to that to that gentleman you mentioned? Um, in all honesty, um, I started with a slightly older side. And... Even though I'd say it was massively different, there's a couple of sessions that haunt me and still haunt me because I can remember a couple of sessions where I returned to type of how I was coach where I've just ripped into the team and, you know, just totally bollocked them because they've played badly. Um, and instead of doing what I do now, which is go away and reflect on my own coaching, you know, what was my part in that? So even though I'd like to think it massively differed from his, I think, particularly in my early days, there's a couple of sessions that really haunt me. And every time one of the players from that team contacts me because they still do, I think, oh, I couldn't have been that bad because at least, at least, you know, they'll still, they'll still contact me when they need something or ask me to go have a coffee with them. But yeah, it, you know, you, you, at the time it was dreadful, but I kind of understand where it was probably at in terms of stress and, and probably knowledge as well. You, you mentioned your previous playing background. Do you think that's important in terms of being an elite coach within your field, or do you think that there is a there's a balance needed in terms of knowledge and understanding of certain activities? There's definitely a, a balanced knowledge, but I, I truly believe you don't have to have played a sport to be a great coach. I think there's the certain the certain skills that you get from um, business, the certain skills that you'll get from other jobs that are, are huge within rugby league um, or any sport. Um, the technical, tactical side of it is important. You've got to grasp it. You've got to get an understanding based on the level that you're coaching at. But I think all the other skills, I think some of them are natural, depending on your personalities, but some of them you learn from other sports. I um, I, I currently work with a part-time coach, and he's a, he's a former policeman. He was National Crimes Agency, um, quite high up. I love that I mentioned him, um, Graham. And um, Graham brings with him a lot of organisational qualities, a lot of people qualities, that I see some really experienced coaches that have operated at the very top of, of, of sport that have not got his qualities because coaching is all about people and I think that's the most important thing. So therefore, when I reflect on do you need to have played the game, at times it can help, um, but I've, I've been involved in a lot of situations where it's, it's been the opposite. It's actually um, killed coaches. Mm -hmm. So do you think this transferability in terms of skills and into different industries, I presume, that you kind of alluded to, yeah? Yeah, 100%. Um, is there limitations? There may be limitations, but, you know, some of my favourite coaches outside of rugby league, so Jose Mourinho played but didn't play at the highest level. Arsene Wenger, I believe, didn't play or played at a low level, and, and it just shows that you still can push the top with knowledge. Um, but, yeah, uh, there's, there, I always think there's a side of coin where you've played at such a high level um, that your expectation is everybody can do what you do and um, without naming a coach I can remember one coach that I coached that was it was kind of a weird one really because he was my hero um, when I was when I was playing as a kid 
And I was lucky enough to turn semi-professional and actually be coached by, it was like being coached by a hero. In fact, it was being coached by him. But I remember one of the sessions going through a particular play that he used to run and he got great success out of it. And I was the person that was meant to run that play. And um, I was nowhere near what he was and I was nowhere near able to do what he did. But he couldn't see that. He almost thought it was natural. You should be able to do it. You should be as good as me. You should be as fast as me. So... I think that's just one example where um, an elite player presumes that everybody else is elite or that being elite is easy. If you go back to your, your elite days then, as a player, well, I was an elite, but yeah. did you enjoy playing? The, uh, again, um, I, was, I was a type of kid that just wanted to play sports. I wanted to be a footballer. Um, you know, I liked cricket, but only if I was batting. I liked boxing. I just liked sport. So... Signing professional was a strange one for me because I wasn't like all the other kids that it, it was a life ambition that wanted to, um, the, you know, the team I play for, the Bradford, where the kids are obsessed with it. I wasn't obsessed. It just kind of happened. And I'd say I really enjoyed 60% of my playing career. Um, there was definitely a 40% where I look back and I probably did it for um, the finances or I just did it because it, it seems to be the right thing to do because of where you were at and you were privileged or you were so-called being privileged. But yeah, I think a lot of my career, I just kind of did it for the sake of doing it. Um, it was where I was at. Um, and and that, you know, it was something I reflected on when I retired because I went back to my community club, um, a club called Queensbury, the only club that I've ever played for or coached at, um, at a community level. And I actually went back to coach their open age team because it was something that I desperately wanted to do. And um, I ended up playing a few games. And it was only going back, playing the sport, not getting any sort of financial reward, just doing it because you, you, you want to do it. That you, you realise there's a, there's a difference. You know, you, re, you, you did it because you loved it, not because a little bit of money went into your bank account at the end of the month. Did, did you grow up as a fan? Did you grow up, did, were your family involved in, in rugby league? So, first and foremost, my first... <laughs> My first rugby league game was at school um, when I'd have been at primary school and we had a teacher called Mr. Woman and I've, tr I've actually tried really hard to find this teacher because he was really, really inspirational to me and um, I've never been able to trace him. No, I've never spoke about him before, to be fair, but I have tried on a few occasions to try and find him. Um, I remember being in the playground as, as a really young kid and Mr. Woman came over to me and he actually gave me a bollocking for nothing. I'd done nothing. I was just playing with my mates, playing football. And he gave me a bollocking and he turned around to me and went, you've got a week's detention. And I was like, wow. And he went, the only way you can get out of detention is to play a rugby league this Friday. And I was actually going to end up playing two years up. And it was like, well, I'm either going to play rugby or I'm going to have a week's detention. I'll take rugby. So we turned up to this game against our local rivals and I was sat on, I was on the bench. I'm, I was going to say sat on the bench, he was stood. And there were loads of um, substitutions, um, substitutes, sorry. And um, I kind of stood there all game, just watching the game. And there must have been three or four minutes left. And he went, oh, well, you're here, you're dressed, so you may as well go on now. And um, and I went on, we were getting absolutely drubbed. And um, I got the ball and I scored a full length of the field try with my first touch. It was the only try we scored. So we then built a really good relationship. But... Um, what then really drove me was my brother, who was also a professional player. Um, he joined um, a community club called Queensbury and started playing at Queensbury. And like, like most kids, you want to be your older brother. So that kind of got me on the path, if you like. And I suppose <laughs> I spent a lot of my junior years trying to be like my older brother. And that really then dragged me into community. And before you know it, he'd signed professional and I got professional offers. So... Well, you know, Baz has done it. I've been offered it, so I just kind of fell into it in, 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 a, in a really strange way. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, still, I still enjoy all sports. I think what, what is special about rugby league um, and other, other sports will argue the same, but it's the friendships that you make. It really is a family sport. Um, the derivatives are fantastic. So, obviously, I coach in women's rugby currently, but there's learning disabilities, physical disabilities, rugby league, there's touch, there's tag. But what you always tend to find in rugby league is it's a it's a family thing. The whole family gets involved in one way or another, um, and I think it, it's unique in terms of you know 
there's there's people from different walks of life and it doesn't cost you a fortune to take part. So I, I think I think it's just one of them sports where anybody, regardless of who you are, can rock up to a community club, um, sign up and, and, and you'll find a place. You'll find a place within that club. And like me, you'll find people that you probably wouldn't you wouldn't be mates with, you wouldn't hang around with, you wouldn't, you know, move around with, um, and you'll, you'll just become friends for life. So I think rugby league is real, especially in that in that um, in that in that way. You mentioned community. Then, yeah. do you think it's very integrated in terms of a cultural aspect? Again, it goes back to heritage and tradition and those yeah. factors as well. You know, my opinion on that is it, it is that, but the game is played throughout the UK, but it's the strongest in the north. You know. Yeah. Everybody talks about the M62 corridor, but you know there is teams in London, there's teams in the Midlands, there's teams in Cornwall. You know they are spread all over, but it predominantly is a northern sport, um, and that's something that the game wrestles with, and, and you know it, it needs to expand, and it's trying to expand. But um, us Northerners that sometimes want want it as our sport, when actually, for me, it needs to just just be out there. You mentioned expansion, and it's going to be out there. What challenges does rugby league face at the moment as, as a sport as a whole? I, I suppose it, it, it's it's financial constraints um, to, to begin with. Um, wherever we play, we're surrounded by some pretty big sports as well. So getting getting the finances in um, to actually run the clubs the way they should be. At times, I think there's too many, particularly at a professional level. Um, at times, I think there's too many clubs because... I don't know that the player pathway is big enough to to support the amount of clubs we've got, or you know the path the player pathway is big enough, but there's not enough quality. Um, and for us as a sport, I mean, if I look at the men's super league, I think it's fantastic, but I think the difference in levels from top to bottom, uh, uh, the the gap's too wide. And if you know, watching a top three team play against each other looks so different to a top team versus a bottom or a bottom versus a bottom. And I'm not trying to be disrespectful to any clubs because they all work hard. I just think we need to raise the bar. We need participation to increase and, and we need to take our blinkers off and, and accept teams from, 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 you know, from other countries, from different parts of, of, um, uh, of the country. You know, an example of that, we've got Toulouse who are just, We've got two French teams. We've got um, Catalan Dragons, fantastic club, fantastic coach and people. Um, we've got Toulouse. Um, I don't know Toulouse, the people at Toulouse too much. Um, funny enough, the coach is a, a good friend of my brother's and I know one or two of the players, but I found it really exciting having them in Super League this year. They've, they've recently been relegated, um, and so they should because that's the way the competition works. But, you know, I think we've actually lost something by allowing them to be relegated. relegated. Um, there should have been a way to keep them in, um, because at the end of the day, you know, Toulouse it's it's one of the biggest um, cities in France, and how do we not want something like that in in our top tier competition? So yeah, we we need to do better. We need to be smarter, um, and we need a real strong um, playing pool. If I add a strand to that, so the female game, which obviously yeah. you represent, is there any challenges there in terms of? Promoting, promoting the sport and more participation in, in that sense, in terms of equality, etc. Yeah, I think I, I, th I think first and foremost the sport's done really well. We in the last four to five years, I, I know I've been um, involved in the women's game, even though I did have some exposure to it before. Then I think it, it, it's been fantastic. A lot of the a lot of the women's teams are now being adopted by the Super League clubs or Championship clubs. And you're now getting clubs that are throwing great resource at clubs. It's not equal. Some are doing more than others and are, and are therefore dominating. Um, but I think we've grown massively in the last four or five years. I think the only barriers are, again, blinkers and, and resource. You know, you know, the club that I work for, St. Tellens, have thrown a lot of resource at their, their women's team. I've got success. York City Knights have done the same. They're getting great success. Leeds Rhinos have done the same. And I think right now we need all the other clubs to come on board, support the way these three clubs are supported, and then hopefully um, the game will strengthen um, and, and grow. And I think on the back of that, everything else will come with it. More sponsorship, um, hopefully a Sky TV deal. And, you know, it, it's frightening to see where the women's game can go in the next few years. But the great thing is um, the women's game is on up at the moment. Rugby is a very masculine sport. Yeah. 
and you've got females partaking in that. Is, is that a challenge for you in terms of maybe the, some of the stigmas that are associated with those aggressive sports and trying to widen participation? Do, do, do you ever find that as a challenge in your current role at the moment or are perceptions changing? I'm just intrigued to hear your, yeah, I your think, views, views I, on that. I think perceptions are, are changing. Um, you know, if you jump on Twitter, there's always one or two negative comments from dinosaurs, um, I'll describe them as. But I think it's changing. What we've what we've seen in the last few years is um, we've seen some great athletes come across and, um, and and end up at some of the top top clubs. You know, when I think of individuals like um, Amy Arcastle, Jordy Cunningham, um, Yalia Burke, a former gymnast coming across the rugby league, um, they look very different to what people perceive female rugby league players will look like. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, very athletic. Um, um, you know, if they're in a dress, they look like they look like any other female, young female that's out, out there. And I think what that's done is it's opened people's eyes. And when you look throughout the pathway, you see really good young athletic girls taking up the sport. You're seeing parents buying into it because they're seeing these role models that look like their daughters. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's just opened people's eyes to the sport. And I think people are earning that you can, you know, you can play the game look good and actually and if you're in the correct condition you're not going to pick up daft injuries it's not it's not a drink culture it, it, it's actually about staying fit having fun uh, meeting some great people and actually there's a little bit of um, fame for one or two of them these days as well so i think people's perceptions on the women's games have changed because the one thing to do is they can also play and the standard of rugby league is increasing all the time and you know it's, it's turned into a really really attractive game yeah, interesting to hear your points. I spoke to Kick It Out last week, and they mentioned people in leadership, um, especially around ethnicity, but they also, you know, come like this to, to, to the women's game as well. Is that there needs to be more representation in terms of leadership? Do, do you have that within rugby league? Is that is that changing as well? Because again, the approach from other organisations, other sports, is kind of like a, a top-down approach. Yeah. So people at the top, it filters down in terms of maybe participation, community, etc. Is is that something that's been pushed in rugby league? So we, we've got our own um, tackle it program, and we're trying to get out there and 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 get to the masses. You know, get to people from different backgrounds. You know, uh, whether it's uh, from ethnic backgrounds or or, or, or whatever it is, uh, we need to do more. It is my honest uh, opinion. There's, there's not enough different people within the women's game or the game in general. I don't think there's enough people um, of. Um, Different backgrounds in key positions within the game. Um, you know, I, you know, I, I, I'll generally walk into a meeting um, wherever that's that is, or I'll walk into a club, and I'll struggle to see someone that looks like me. And you know, even even within the players, I think that 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 that's the case. And I think for some of the some of the young kids coming through, unless you can see something. And believe that you can be it. I don't think you'll 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 want to get there. I, I I was lucky. I had a couple of uh, real good role models that were playing the game that I looked up to. But one of my biggest role models was my brother. So I naturally followed my brother. Um, but I don't think um, we we we're quite diverse enough, and, and more needs to be done. Um, and and that alone would strengthen the sport. You mentioned your brother, yeah. your role model. Did he have any um, challenges in terms of? Equality, etc. Um, I think back when I played in the nineties, my brother played in the nineties. Um, it was a massive challenge, and you know, I'll start by saying the game has moved on a hell of a lot. Um, the the game has improved when it when it comes to um, you know um, things that would happen within the games when I played. So you know, whether it was racial abuse, behaviours, um, the games moved on. But oh, there were some big challenges back in the day. You know. Um, you name it, I've had it. I, I, I would say we used to have a lot of conversations about some of the things that would go on, and for us, it was about being strong and being a, and ignoring them. I and you, as as a black rugby player or black sportsman, what sports person? Sorry, um, you had to learn to deal with it, um, you know, and, and be strong and get around it. If you didn't, if you reacted, uh, pretty much you would be the bad person. You know, so somebody throws something at you from the crowd, you pick it up, throw it back, you'd be the bad guy. Somebody shouts some racial slur, 
you turn around, you have a go back, you would be the bad guy, you know, or you'd be accused of using the race card. And I, and I, and I think things have moved on recently where um, it doesn't happen or it rarely happens or, you know, where it does, you feel as though you can speak out more. And I'm hoping I'm, I'm making sense of that. And don't get me don't get me wrong, I've met a, a great deal of fantastic people that are lifelong friends um, through the sport. But back in, the, back in the, the early 90s when I was playing, you know, uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff where you know you, you you just had to deal with it. It was almost like it was part of the game, you know, and, and it could be on the field as well. And the referees would would accept it. Um, you know, luckily I'd, it doesn't really happen now, or it, it's infrequent. You know, and if something happens, you, you're more sh- you're shot. You know, um, so yeah. yeah. Your words were, "I've got to deal with it." Yeah. How how did you deal with it? You were expected to, um, you know, you expected to be a man. You were expected to be strong. Uh, you expected to um, just ignore things, and, and that's what you did. And you, you'd almost try and deal with it by playing well, and you know, sticking two fingers up to people in the crowd that would shout something by not sticking up two fingers, but by doing something really good on the pitch. Um, and, and that's how you dealt with it. And you know. You'd chat about it at home, or you'd just simply blank it and just get on, just just, just get on. You know, you, yeah. If you think back to the nineties, you wouldn't have the support you'd have nowadays. You know, you wouldn't have the the psychologist, the welfare, the you know, you know, or somebody within the club that would do something about it, or a steward that might say, "Actually, I'm throwing this person out of the ground." So you, you just you just dealt with it. It was it was it was almost expected when you went to certain grounds. You knew. It was like feeding forward, right? I'm playing at, at this venue, and I won't name the clubs, but I'm playing at this club. This is what I'm going to get. I'm playing at this club. Actually, I'm going to be all right this week. There might just be the odd thing, but certain clubs you knew what was coming, um, so you'd already fed forward. Therefore, you you you, you were kind of you know you were, you were armed to deal with it before it happened. You were expecting it. If it didn't happen, it was like, wow, we've got off lightly here. What what's going on today? We must have lost. <laughs> that that was almost the attitude, and your teammates, your teammates were great. Your teammate, you know, generally, I was real lucky when I played at Bradford and the great coaches like David Obbs, Tommy Smales. You know, have great teammates, and in my team there were quite a few black players as well. So we would talk as a group about it. But you, you know, these guys would would would, would have your back no matter what, and, and that helped as well. Did you think that very impacted performance from a psychological point of view? Because again, the research is coming out is recently around social media and the impact on and player performance um, in terms of abuse. The stuff that I would hear, because um, I'd almost expected it, I, I'd kind of just crack on. It'd affect you. After the game, it may affect you. And it'd, it'd um, you know, I can remember a few games where people are going to the clubhouse and they're going for something to eat. And there was a few clubs where I'd refuse to do it. I'd just go. I'd rather just go sit on the coach, and people would go. He's a bit miserable, and he's a bit weird, and they wouldn't get it. You didn't feel welcome, so therefore you, you didn't go in to them places, and you 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 know you'd go do something else. You know you'd go jump on the coach with a couple of the other lads and have a drink. But I, I don't think it affected my performance. It probably went the other way a couple of times where it fired up that much. I was that angry. You know, rugby league's a, a pretty contact sport. It's a contact sport, and it was a more physical sport in them days. So I actually think there's a couple of days where I'd kind of lost my head a little bit, and it probably drove me to try that a little bit harder or be that a little bit more aggressive or, or, or whatever. Yeah. In your, in your role now as, as kind of a leader um, with the England the international league, do, yeah. do, these, do these issues arise at all? Or you, you mentioned we've kind of moved on. Um, <laughs> you know, because obviously, I'm sure people come up to you and, and see you as a bit of a role model. You, know, you mentioned your brother. I'm sure that might have been a knock-on effect on, on younger generations and yeah. the leadership position you're in. I'll be careful what I, what I say because we, <laughs> we you know, we're, we're a couple of months or so away from the World Cup. Right. The, there's areas where I sit back and I laugh and things go against me, um, or you 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 treat in a certain way. And um, I'd say a lot of it is unconscious on their part, but also very conscious on my part. So I don't excuse it, but I accept it um, because I'm on a journey and I want to go out there and prove something. 
Um, it's not around racial slurs. I think it, it it's around different areas where you do say and think, actually, if I was different, I wouldn't be treated like this. If I was different, there'd be a bit more exposure. If I was different, I wouldn't be sat in a room with the press elsewhere and not actually interested. Um, and, I, and I do have to be careful what I say. But, yeah, there's certain things where I'll go, I'll go and I'll speak to friends and one or two have come back and said, actually, I, I didn't get it. I thought you were paranoid, but I get it now. I get it from one or two people's, people's behaviour. So, we, we, you know, we, we've got, we're, we're doing some great things in rugby league. We're doing some great things in, in sport. But, you know, there's, there's, a, long way, there's a long way to go. Um, there's a long, there's a long way to go. Um, certain things are not in your face, but certain things are there, and 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 I have to be mindful um, because you know people's perceptions. It would always get turned back on me if I spoke out, if I spoke about out about some of the things I'm not happy with. Um, it would always come back on me, and that's where you are. Um, so a, a, again, you put up a brick wall, you crack on, and, and you do the best job you can. Um, to be fair, and, you know, as a as a as a as a black coach in, in in my sport, you just hope that you you're making it easy for the next person, and the person after him and the person after him to be, you know, till it gets to the stage where it's actually it's a norm. Um, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll 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 try and be a smart and careful of what I say because, you know. You, you, you mentioned your coaching. So, what is your philosophy on coaching then? I think I've gone along the journey where you know you, you, you start to jot things down, you you start to try and live by a philosophy, but you then you recognise that it's ever changing. Um, and I've I've always had had a bit of a statement really in terms of my philosophy, in terms of I'm responsible, um, and it's stolen from somebody else. By the way, I won't mention the person I stole them by because. A few truths have come out of him, and he doesn't deserve to be mentioned. But actually, um, the "I'm responsible" thing is something I try and live by, where I try not to blame others um, when things go wrong um, on my watch. Whether it's a player, whether it's somebody within admin or whatever, I always try and throw it back on me and think, "Right, I need to be better because I expect my players to be better. I expect staff that work with me to be better." But I, you know, I recognise it all comes from me. Um, there's a few statements that I have in there that I try and live by. One of them is honesty. I try to be as honest as possible, um, but I also feel it's not always possible to be honest because you'll upset people. So you sugarcoat it, and sometimes you tell people what you want. But in a lot of areas, I will be brutally honest with people, um, and I expect I always expect that back. Um, and yeah, for me, it, it's just about my philosophy is about doing your best. And if you're doing your best and you know you're carrying yourself in a certain way, then I expect the best from my players because you can't do you can't do better than your best in, in in any area. So whether that's nutrition, whether that's tech tech, whether that's emotional intelligence, now you deal with people in the environment. If you're doing your best, um, I, I, I can live with that because um, like we talked about, you know, we touched on earlier. You get people from different walks of life. Our behaviors are different. Some behaviours are more acceptable within certain environments, but actually, some people will do things that isn't great. But are they actually doing the best? Are, 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 are they trying? If they are, um, you know, I'll always live with that. You, have you been like, inspired from anyone from your playing career or, or your journey in coaching where it's really shaped who you are in terms of your values and your outlook towards rugby league? Yeah, I'm, I'm a bit of a, I suppose, a magpie. I steal from everybody. So, um, I like I like I like to um, I like to watch coaches, but more than what they um, do, it's how they do it, what they say, how they behave. So I, I'm really lucky uh, within my day job because you, you get to to see people like Christian Wolf, the St. Ellen's and Tonga head coach. You get to look at his behaviours. You know, we've got a great coach at Saint and Tall, but I get to look at his behaviours. I reflect really, really hard on people that have, have coached me. And there's certain things that coaches have done that I don't want anything to do with. So that impacts me just as much in terms of I don't want to be like that coach in this area, but actually I want to take that from him. So, yeah, I, I take my inspiration from from loads of places. I, I have three or four mentors that I also 
try and speak with as much as possible and I, I take things from them. Um, there's guys out there that I've, I've, well, I want to say one of them I've never met, but one of them I recently met. So I like to, I like to watch as much of Eddie Jones from Ruby Union as possible because there's certain things that he does that are genius. Jose Mourinho, I love the way he deals with media. Um, you know, um, that cheekiness, that brass, that in your face. Um, so I, I just take inspiration from everywhere, and I, and I, uh, and I, and yeah, you just try and be the best you can be, don't you? What process do you use in terms of reflective practice? Yeah, um, in in terms of process, I suppose again you start off using all these models and your simple models like your cold, your cold model um, has been something that's influenced me, um, and I tend to now just be the coach that disappears during camp for an hour, uh, back to my room, and I'll just sit and I'll just sketch things down and. I'll always try and get a couple, from every session I'll try and get a couple of critical moments where they can be positive or they can be negative, they can be a way I've talked to somebody, they can be a way I've, I've um, dealt with somebody and I'll always try and make sense of that and just, just really try and unpick it as much as I can. Um, I'm really lucky because again I have certain people so the, the Saints women's head coach is also my assistant coach England Dick Hardman, um, you know, who He's someone that I can talk to. He'll give me some real honesty. He'll sugarcoat it. I know he sugarcoats it, but he's real honest. Um, my brother, again, is brutally honest, really brutally honest. He'll just tell me as it is, regardless of feelings. Um, so I, I do bring people into my reflections, but people that I know won't tell me what I want to hear because I'm surrounded by too many of them that give me what I want to hear and not the... The gut wrenching truth that actually, Craig, you were really, really poor on your actions there. Craig, you were out of order. You actually owed that player an apology. Or Craig, you could have dealt with it differently. Or actually, Craig, you were brutal, but I actually, I, I think you were right. But tell me why. So, yeah, there's, there's a lot of self reflection. I always try and pick out two or three little bits. And then I'm, I try and think, right, who do I need to go to to reaffirm that I was good or bad? And then I'll, again, I use the word feed forward. I tend to go into a lot of my coaching sessions um, with things or scenarios that I want to happen, conversations I know that I want to happen, and whether that's challenging a person to see what their reaction is, to achieve to fall off a cliff or not, or challenge a, a player technically, tactically. I, I try and go into sessions. Uh, people will probably wonder why, why I, I always carry a book when I coach. And I'll look into it and the players must be, what's he doing? <laughs> and actually, if they actually read it and looked through, which I've caught a couple doing, by the way, they'll see something in there that might relate to them, where I'm at some stage, I'm going to pose a question at them, I'm going to throw a challenge at them, or I'm going to try and get a reaction out of them. And, and I suppose in my, you know, my world of, you know, whatever is up there is a mess, but there is some sort of uniformity in there, what I want. You said the responsibility you got, and then you've got your team, and then you've got your mentors, and you mentioned your brother. How do you know what decision to make? Because I can imagine that there's a lot of opinion, a lot of suggestion. How do you know that you're making the right decision? Um, I try my best to, to listen to um, any any sort of anything smart that's coming in. So that could be stuff that's um, being recorded. It could be stats. It could be it could be whatever. So from a science point of view, I try and embrace that as much as I can um, and then at the very end of all that for me it's your gut feeling I, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in going with your gut feeling but you're surrounding your gut feeling with evidence because yeah your gut can be wrong but actually your gut feeling is based on your experience based on your beliefs you know if you want to use the word philosophy it's based on your philosophy and, and just being true to yourself um, so a lot of decisions I'll make a lot of things I'll do um, does it feel right? Is my gut telling me it's right? Can I can I look that person in the eye? Because I'm, I'm a big one for trying not to leave situations where I can't eyeball somebody and, and, and have a conversation with them, you know, based around a, a decision. Because um, I don't mind being challenged. And if I can't look someone in the eye and be open and honest with them and have a conversation, then something's wrong, my gut's let me down or I've ignored something that I shouldn't have ignored. 
I get the sense that you you like to see objectivity rather than subjectivity. So in terms of maybe decision making and etc. How important is analysis and technology within your your practice? Um, yeah, very very important. Um, again, this is where your gut can you, you can let you down, and um, and I think within the role I've been in for the last four nearly five years now, um, I've learned more and more, and I've learned that sometimes it, you know you make some snap, snap judgments about individuals. Um, an example of that, I can remember driving home and sort of like my drive home from particularly England training, it'll take me an hour and a half. So there's a lot of reflection time in there. And I remember driving home and there's a couple of players and one in particular, and I won't name that again. But I remember thinking, did she even train today? Because I can't remember a thing that she's done. She's done nothing that's jumped out on me. She's cruised through the session. Then I've got home, and then the GPS data has landed. Um, you know, Neil, fantastic. He sent it through dead air like he you know, normally does. And I've got home, and I've looked at the meters per minute. I've looked at the yard is covered. And this girl has led everything. And and that that has taught me a lesson. Like these snapshot judgments driving home sometimes. Sometimes you need evidence um, to back it up. Um, so GPS is huge. Um, for me, video analysis is, is huge and I, and I try and use all that before I actually feed back to people. The one thing I hate, and, but you get it every session, I, I don't like players that come up to me and ask me how they've trained. How have I gone, Craig? What have I done? What do I need to work on? You have to give them something. If you don't give them something, they take it as a negative. But I, I actually don't like giving them anything. I'd rather the session ends, uh, you all go home, I'll go home, I'll collect my thoughts, I'll watch the video, I'll look at GPS, I'll listen to the assistant coaches and, and um, you know, s and C. I'll let them feed in, I'd rather them feed back to you because you miss you miss so much and you, you don't always see. Sometimes you see what you want to see. Uh, so, you know, it's really funny, my captain, Emily Rudge, um, I struggle to see any wrong. She'll laugh when she sees this, but I struggle to see any wrong with her. So to find wrong in it, I have to go back and watch the training video. I have to see the game video and think, actually, no, Emily, you did it the wrong line. It wasn't It wasn't the half back. It wasn't the et cetera. So I think sometimes you blink as a coach. You, you, you see what you want to see. So, yeah, technology, science is really important because sometimes you need it to direct you exactly, um, it, you know, where it needs to be. And, it, and that, that can be used to take away your bias because... We all have a bias. I talked about the bias, you know, the unconscious stuff, but we all we are all biased in some shape or form, whether whether we like it or not. Do you get emotional as a coach? It's hard to not buy into, to not buy into personalities, yeah. um, and I take a lot of things really personal. Um, yeah, I, you know, um, I take a lot of things really personal, and I struggle with people that let me down. When people let me down, um, I, I struggle with it. And that's why I can't coach off snapshots. I need to go away and think things through. Um, if I always said what I feel, <laughs> I'd probably be out of a job because I do recognise that I am I am a really emotional person. Um, but I recognise that, you, you know, my players will laugh because in certain areas of the game, I always... I'm on my players about taking the emotion out of your game. And my big thing is I have to take the emotion out of my coaching. Um, Cause if I, you know, if I'd always said what I think I'd be wrong. Well, <laughs> probably 70% of the time I'd be wrong in terms of what I'm thinking or what I'm feeling at that moment. So I am an emotional person, but I'd like to think that I've, I've now got I've got them emotions of control, and I know a lot about myself, and and I, and I control it, and I ask my players to not act on on emotions, particularly when, um, you know, from a rugby league point of view, when you're defending as a team, you've got to take the emotion out of it. There's a structure, there's a philosophy, there's um, you know, there's 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 a way to play. There's you know, carry out your role, take the emotions out of it. Do what I'm set. Do what we're meant to do within our structures, not what you're thinking at that moment. Um, I suppose the other side of the game, when you've got the ball and you're in nice field position and you're attacking, you want a bit of emotions. You want them to act on what they're thinking and what they're seeing. 
So it, it's it's a double-edged sword. You had to work on that. So you said you said, you said then if I if I if I spoke I'd be out of a job. Have you had to work on that over time? Yeah. Have you realised you've had to kind of maybe yeah. change yeah. ways of communication? Yeah. When you when you're playing, you're responsible for your role within the team. Um, but you, you know you, you're a, you're a kid really, aren't you? And you go out there and you do, you, you go out and you do your job. Sometimes you do it great. Sometimes you you, you do it poor. Um, you know, and there's there's a, a few things that have changed. If I was, you know, I'd have liked to have coached myself. Um, to be fair, um, there's a few things that have changed, and there's a, a few times, there's quite a few times where I probably wouldn't have selected myself. If I'm honest. Um, but what you do is you mature and you learn and you learn a lot about yourself and you know you're doing your magpie bit where you're stealing bits from other coaches and and, and, and I suppose you shape yourself as a coach and you, you've got to recognize you've got to recognize what type of person you are you've got to recognize that you're an emotional person but actually there's times where that's great there's times when it's not great um, so you, I suppose you learn through experience to, and you learn through mistakes don't you you make mistakes so you know Earlier on, we touched on when I first started coaching, and you know, like Queensbury, it had been Queensbury on the 13s team, and there's a couple of sessions that haunt me because I ripped into the team because I've lost. That was me being emotional, and actually, it wasn't about the team, um, it was about them losing. When actually, it's done the 13s team, there's nothing wrong with losing, there's nothing wrong with playing bad, but because I've let, let down the throats emotionally and copied what almost what has been done to me as a player my output was to scream at them whereas nowadays if we lose badly and that i'm not happy um the team tends to sit there and wait for a reaction from you and i'll give a couple of controlled reactions in terms of guys not good enough but now's not the time to solve it um let's get out of here and then I'll know that by giving my time to reflect, review the footage, other people's opinions, reflect on what my role was within it. It allows me to be more calculated, more measured, and hopefully give the team information that will help them move forward. Because that's what you're trying to do, aren't you? You're trying to move forward. Sometimes your position is better than you. It's as simple as that. You know, you come up against teams that are better on the day, you come up against individual great players that do something that you can't control. Um, so the win, win and lose, you, you learn how to deal with it, and you learn how to, to coach around it, don't you? You know, you, you know, you, you reframe what winning is really sometimes as a coach. You know, because there's always wins within a loss, or there's always other wins within a win. So you've got the the World Cup this year, the Women's World Cup. Um, how do you prepare for that, and what are the expectations? Um, the expectations would depend on who you speak to. Um, I've spent four years. Do my best to prepare um, a squad and select a team that goes out and, and, and wins the World Cup. Um, I can't think any differently. Um, it just doesn't enter my train of thought. Otherwise, I wouldn't do what I'm doing. You wouldn't sacrifice as much as what you sacrifice. So, the expectations from me and hopefully the players that I select, um, you know, it will be to get it right and get a genuine group of people that feels all where it's a big task, but where they're to win the World Cup. Um, I don't know that expectation exists outside of that room. Um, I wish I had a, I wish I had a, a pound for the amount of people that offered me advice on how to just survive the World Cup and do okay and not be embarrassing. And don't worry, you won't beat Australia, you won't beat New Zealand, you won't beat whoever. Um, there's a lot of people that, for some reason, always want to give me that advice that it's not doable. Um, but yeah, in terms of preparation. Um, I suppose what you do first and foremost is select the, the correct people. The correct people's not always the best players because some people don't fit what's needed within the team to, to become a team and become a team that can go and win. Um, and to wrap it in a nutshell, it's just um, working hard, me working hard, a group of people working hard and getting the little things right, knowing that the little things will turn into big things. Major event. Um, where can we find information about the uh, the Women's World Cup? And yeah, so um, you know the the the, R, the Rugby Football League website, the Rugby League World Cup website. Um, hopefully, there's enough adverts out there on radio and banners around the place as well. But yeah, the Rugby League uh, World um, Rugby League World Cup website. 
um, has got a ton of information. You know, hopefully there's there's games on your doorstep, reasonably price, um, priced games as well. And um, you know, the great thing about rugby league is you can be just anybody from any walk of background. Go get yourself to a stadium, and I guarantee you will feel welcome, and I guarantee you'll be entertained. Um, it's really funny because it's one of the sports where you can walk into a stadium, not understand the sport, not actually knowing what's going on, but you'll be entertained and you'll come away um, having enjoyed it, you know, within within what will be um, a, a great atmosphere with, you know, some of the countries that are playing, you know, teams from Papua New Guinea, Tonga, Brazil in the in the women's get in the women's game, Canada. You know, you're going to see a multitude of people that will entertain you in different ways and, and play a different brand of the same sport because um, it really is an entertaining sport. Are you excited, yeah? Yeah, I'm really excited. Um, you're at that stage now where you can almost taste it, it's close. So you almost just want, you just want to get in there now. <laughs> you know, you want to get the grand finals in a couple of weeks' time, you want the grand final out of the way, you want to know what squad you've got to, you know, fit and ready to go. And you want to get in there and, you know, I always say to my players, uh, you want to go in there and you really, you've got to enjoy it. You know, I know, I know as a player, you, you, you're getting some games, you're getting some reasonably big games, and it comes and goes, and you sit in the in the change rooms and you think, wow, it flash, it, it it just flew, the game flew, you did not enjoy the occasion, and you walk away having feel as though you've lost something. So I'm really big about the players enjoying it. I'm hoping I can enjoy it. Um, you know, there's going to be some stresses, but my main thing is I want the players to have a really good experience, play well, let's go win the thing, but no matter what, and, and embrace embrace the pressure that comes with it, um, but make sure you take time to look around and, and, and enjoy the occasion. Final question. So if you could go back to the beginning of your coaching career, what one advice would you give yourself? Beginning of my coaching career, uh, it's a tough one, really. Um, probably, probably just around that that enjoyment and that winning isn't everything. I, I, I think when you when you first start off coaching, there's an obsession that as a coach you're there to win. Um, so it would be relax a bit, Craig. Work a bit harder but work hard on individuals as rugby players and people and, and see where that gets you. Um, there'd be something in there around not focusing on, on who you think are the best players because some of the players in the team that get your full attention because you in the early days you think, oh, they're the person that may go on and do something. That's not important because you don't know one. You don't know who them people are that are going to kick on and do something, and actually just go coach the team and go coach them as a group of people. Um, yeah, it'd be it, 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 it somewhere around all that. Listeners, where where could they find you? Are you on social media? Are you? Um, yeah, so, on, uh, online. Yeah, I suppose I'm, I'm more active on um, on, on Twitter, uh, Craig underscore Rich Twelve. Um, but yeah, I'm 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 on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. I don't know what Instagram <laughs> thing is, but yeah, uh, mainly on Twitter, really. I suppose we'll, we'll those links in the, the description. And um, good luck with the, the World Cup. Cheers, thank you. And uh, I'm yes. sure I'll come down and come down and watch and support. Yep. Um, but good luck. Thank you. For yeah, thank you very much. Thank cheers, you. Mate. Yeah. Cheers. Thank you.